This video is all about structure, but we're not going to talk about structure so much as a template that you put onto your story. We're going to try to work more from the inside out and how you can help build your plot from character. I'm going to give you a lot of different techniques and we're going to use Legally Blonde as an example. <laughs> Now something that can help you figure out your character, and I pull this book out a lot, and again, this is the old version of the book, the new cover looks like this, but this book will help you figure out your lead character's archetype, and that just means why they do the things they do, and possibly some of the flaws they have that need to be changed. So take Legally Blonde. We have Elle Woods, the perky, sunny, pink and blonde sorority girl who loves fashion. According to this book, from what I can figure out, I think her character is a waif. What are the characteristics of a waif? It says the waif projects a childlike innocence, a soul-stirring susceptibility. She is naive, enigmatic, yet resilient. Everyone she meets wants to save her, but she can surprise people with her incredible inner strength and fortitude. It says that her virtues are that she's pure, she's trusting, she's kind, and her flaws are that she's impressionable, she's passive, and she's insecure. Well, in the story of Legally Blonde, at the end, she gives a speech and it kind of gives more the theme and her journey, what she learned on this journey. You must always have faith in people. And most importantly, you must always have faith in yourself. She learned to trust herself more, to have self-acceptance. So this whole story, this journey, supports that change. Now let's talk about the first technique that you can use to structure your story based on character. Now no matter what archetype you choose for your lead, and in this book there's eight for the guys and eight for the girls, Jeffrey Allen Schechter, who wrote this book, I have a big pile of books everywhere, this book right here, my story can beat up your story. This is a great, great book. He's got some Udemy courses. He has a YouTube channel with a video. He has great, great stuff. I put all the links for all his stuff down below. I highly recommend his book. It's very thin, but it's very simple. And one of the things I like about him as well, he's a working writer. And this one technique from his book is only like a couple pages out of this whole book. It's that good. Now, what does he say? He says, no matter what archetype your character is, and for Elle, I think she She's the waif from the book. He says your character will go through four archetypes during the course of the script. Orphan, Wanderer, Warrior, and Martyr. The beauty of this is it actually gives you a three-act structure with a nice little midpoint in the middle. So let's talk about this. The first one is Orphan. He says that in most stories, the character either starts an orphan or becomes an orphan. We can see this in a lot of movies. Take Star Wars. Luke Skywalker is an orphan in the beginning, or so he thinks. He doesn't know his dad is still alive. He's living with his aunt and uncle, and then in the very beginning of the story, his aunt and uncle are killed, and he's orphaned again. Take The Wizard of Oz. Dorothy is also an orphan. She's living with her aunt and uncle, and then she's swept away to Oz, and she is disconnected from her family. She's orphaned again. Take John McClane in Die Hard. He's divorced, so he's separated from his wife, and he's going to somewhere he's never been before. He doesn't know the people. It's a new town. He is orphaned from the place that he knows. So how does the orphan beat play itself out in the movie Legally Blonde? This is Warner, the guy she wants to marry. She immediately goes out shopping with her friends to buy the perfect dress for when he is going to propose. There's nothing I love more than a dumb blonde with daddy's plastic. <laughs> I know, he gets excited when he Did you see this one? We just got it in yesterday. Oh, is this low viscosity rayon? Uh, yes, of course. With a half loop top stitching on the hem? Absolutely, it's one of a kind. It's impossible to use a half loop top stitching on low viscosity rayon. It would snag the fabric. And you didn't just get it in. I saw it in the June Vogue a year ago. So if you're trying to sell it to me for full price, you picked the wrong girl. It shows us how she's a little orphaned from society that outside of her little clique, her little tiny sorority, people discount her. They just think she's a dumb blonde. And then it gets worse. You're breaking up with me? I thought you were proposing. Proposing? <laughs> oh, if I'm gonna be a senator, well, I need to marry a Jackie, not a Marilyn. <laughs> so you're breaking up with me because I'm too 
Avant? She's dumped. She's orphaned again. I need someone serious. He, along with society, does not take her seriously. Then she figures out that because Warner's brother is marrying a girl who's in law school, that if she can get into law school, she'll prove she's serious and she can get Warner back. A law student. She goes to her parents to tell them her plan. Going to Harvard is the only way I'm gonna get the love of my life back. Oh, sweetheart, you don't need law school. Law school's for people who are boring and ugly and Serious. And you, Button, are none of those things. She gets dissed by the parents, again, orphaned. Then she arrives at Harvard. She's completely orphaned from her friends, from her family. She is completely alone. Look! Harvard! This is where it gets into the second archetype, the wanderer. Now she's kind of a fish out of water. She doesn't quite know what to do. She's trying to fit in. This is what Blake Schneider in the book Save the Cat would call the fun and games. When you think about Legally Blonde and you see the poster, you think about the girl with the blonde hair and the pink running around where she doesn't belong in Harvard. That's this section. Oh, two weeks ago, I saw Cameron Diaz at Fred Siegel, and I talked her out of buying this truly heinous Angora sweater. Whoever said orange was the new pink was seriously disturbed. <laughs> there are rules of this world that she does not understand. Um, I wasn't aware that we had an assignment. Vivian Kensington, do you think it's acceptable that Ms. Woods is not prepared? <laughs> no. I don't. And she gets some bad news when she finds out that Warner is actually engaged to Vivian, a girl who is nothing like Elle. Do you know her? It, she's, uh... I'm his fiance. But she keeps trying. She keeps trying to win him back. Hi. Hi. She finds out about a party he's going to be at, and she's told incorrectly that it's a costume party, so she ends up going like this. <laughs> and she finally confronts Warner about whether or not her plan is ever going to work. We took the same LSATs, and we're taking the same classes. I know, but come on, Elle, be serious. You can do something more valuable with your time. I'm never going to be good enough for you, am I? Now this is where we get into the warrior section. I'll show you how valuable Elle Woods can be. She is on the rampage. There is even a whole montage with a song of girl, go get em power. She gets way more serious about what she wants and what she wants shifts at this point. Before she always wanted Warner, that's what it was all about. Now that that doesn't seem possible, now she's decided she's gonna be the best law student and she's gonna best him in everything. Now here I wanna veer off a little bit from what Jeffrey Allen Schechter teaches and kinda of go into what I talked about in the video, What's the Big Idea? And in that video I talk about how Usually in a movie, one good idea isn't enough. You actually need two good ideas. So let's say you're writing Legally Blonde. You're writing this movie and you come up with the idea. Oh, wouldn't it be funny if this sorority girl who's all pink and blonde ends up at Harvard? Well, if you just leave it at that and that's all it is, in the middle it would start to become repetitive and more the same and she's still trying to get him and she can't. In this film, this is where the story shifts. It twists, it turns. We kind of almost have a second movie that starts. So she applies for an internship and she gets it. Me! She even starts to dress a little differently. We get less of the pink, less of the bling, and more of a subtle conservative look. And now she's working on an actual case with a professor that she highly respects. Defending Brooke Wyndham, whose very wealthy husband was found shot to death in their Beacon Hill mansion. Gold digger? You'd think so, since the stiff was 60, but she was rich on her own, some kind of fitness empire. You can buy her exercise tapes on infomercials. Wait, are, are you talking about Brooke Taylor? Maiden name Taylor. You know her? 
She's a Delta Nu. She wasn't in my pledge class, but she w she graduated four years before me. But I used to take her class at the Los Angeles Sports Club. She's amazing. Amazing? Oh. She can make you lose like three pounds in one class. She's completely gifted. Well, in all likelihood, she's completely guilty as well. She was seen standing over her husband's dead body. I just don't think Brooke could have done this. Exercise gives you endorphins. Endorphins make you happy. Happy people just don't shoot their husbands. But she married an older man and he was murdered and people assume she did it because she's blonde. She must just be the heartless trophy wife. Elle is very sure that her sorority sister did not commit this murder. So she goes to the prison to find out what Brooke's alibi is. Fried function! Oh God! No. I know, I'm a fraud. It's not like normal women can have this ass. If my fans knew that I bought it, I would lose everything. I've already lost my husband. I'd rather go to jail than lose my reputation. Brooke, your secret's safe with me. She finds out the alibi, but she is going to stick to sorority girl code and she will not reveal it. Now here we start to tiptoe into the martyr section of the story. And in the martyr section, that is when the character stops thinking so much about what they want and starts to do more what's right. They start to give up a little of what they thought was important. So that's the first little martyr beat. If she told the alibi, that could win them the case and get her what she wants, but she's gonna do what's right and keep her secret. She starts to think about how she could help other people with the skills that she does have, and then she immediately helps this poor, dorky Harvard guy. Girls like me don't go out with losers like you. Why didn't you call me? What? We spent a beautiful night together and then I never hear from you again? I... I'm sorry? Sorry for what? For breaking my heart or for giving me the greatest pleasure I've ever known and then just taking it away? Uh... Both? Well, forget it. I've already spent too many hours crying over you. When did you want to go out? Huh. And because she stuck to her principles, she stuck to what was right, she starts to win over Warner's fiance, Vivian, and gets her as an ally as well. You know, El, I still can't believe you didn't tell Callahan the alibi. It's not my alibi to tell. I know. And I thought that was very classy of you. Really? She's very determined now to do what is right. She's not so much thinking about what she wants and trying to get Warner. I believe you, Brooke. Take care of me, Al. I will. Then she has a meeting with her professor, the one that she respects, and this happens. What you want and how far you'll go to get it. How far will Al go? Are you hitting on me? You're a beautiful girl. So everything you just said? I'm a man who knows what he wants. And I'm a law student who just realized her professor is a pathetic asshole. She completely loses confidence. She was trying to be accepted. She thought she could be accepted. And this makes her think that is not going to be possible. No, I was just kidding myself. Callahan never saw me as a lawyer. He just saw me as a piece of ass. Just like everybody else. The hell with law school. I just wanted to say goodbye. If you're going to let one stupid prick ruin your life, you're not the girl I thought you were. 
she gets her confidence back and she decides to go for it, but this time something's changed. She is going to, again, the martyr beat, give up what she thought was important. She wanted to be accepted. She wanted to be that vision of what she thought people wanted. She wanted to fit some particular mold. And then she decides, no, she's just going to be who she is. She's going to have self-acceptance instead of trying to get acceptance. So she goes back to the court, full on pink blonde. And she uses her knowledge of fashion in the case. If in fact you weren't washing your hair, as I suspect you weren't because your curls are still intact, wouldn't you have heard the gunshot? And she wins. You, however, had time to hide the gun, didn't you, Chutney? After you shot your father. I didn't mean to shoot him. I thought it was you walking through the door. Order, order. Order. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Bailiff, take the witness into custody. Then we have another martyr beat at the end when Warner talks to her after she won the case. Pooh Bear, I love you. Oh, Warner, I've waited so long to hear you say that. But if I'm going to be a partner in a law firm by the time I'm 30, I need a boyfriend who's not such a complete bonehead. Thank you, boys. I want to spend some extra time on this martyr beat because this is what I see missing the most in amateur screenplays. The character doesn't have to make a tough choice or make a sacrifice. Now that could be a physical sacrifice or a physical risk. They could actually put their life on the line. They could actually put themselves in danger, but it doesn't have to be. It just has to be that they're giving up what they thought was important. They're giving up what they wanted. They're making some kind of sacrifice. Sacrifice. So I'll find scripts where they have the character is making a choice between whether or not she wants Bob or Tom and she walks in on Tom having sex with another girl. So she says, oh, forget you. And then she goes with the other guy. Well, the choice was kind of made for her. She had no other options, so she didn't have to make a choice. So here we have Elle. She gets Warner, but then she rejects him. She doesn't want him. It shows she's changed because that is not the same decision that she would have made in the beginning. So make sure your character sacrifices something, gives something up, makes a tough choice, makes a decision that is different than the decision they would have made in the beginning. That is how you show your character has changed. So that's the first technique to plot your story according to your character. No matter what archetype you choose for them, they go through orphan, wander, warrior, martyr. Now the second technique for structuring your film according to character is to think of your movie more as several different mini movies based on your character's goal. You'll always hear in screenwriting your character needs a goal. Well yes, but like I talked about in that example, sometimes in the middle, the goal can kind of change. You can have the goals change. Like in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker's goal in the very beginning isn't to destroy the Death Star. He doesn't even know about the Death Star. First, he's got to go get the droids. Then he finds the message for Princess Leia. Then he's got to go get the message to Obi-Wan. Then they have to go get the droids somewhere else. There's a progression of little mini goals. And then it isn't until we hit that warrior section that all of a sudden kind of the end goal becomes clear and that is when like they're trying to destroy the Death Star and we know what that's all about. Or in the case of Elle, she's going to take on that court case and she's got as her goal to become an attorney, whereas before it was just to get Warner. So your character doesn't necessarily have to have the same goal the whole time, but they have to kind of be progressions and related goals. You can't have your character want to be a downhill skier and then change their mind and want to be a newscaster and decide, oh, no, they want to become a monk. You know, it has to be kind of related progressions, but you can have many mini goals. So instead of thinking about your one big plot, more think about what's your character's goal here, the goal here, the goal here. And this can also relate to some of your subplots, things like that. So in Legally Blonde, she always had a goal. Her first goal was to get a dress 
to go to dinner with Warner. Then she wanted to get Warner to propose to her. That didn't work. Then she wanted to get into law school. Then she wanted to fit in in law school. Then when that wasn't working, then she decides she wants to be an ace law student and an attorney. So her goals kind of kept changing, but she always had a goal. So you can think of your script as little mini movies where your character has a goal that has kind of a beginning, middle, and end. And you'll find books and other resources that will address this and they more call it the sequence approach where you're making little mini movies. But if you base it on your character's goal and you always make sure your character always wants something, even if it's something small throughout, then you know you have an active lead character and your script should always be interesting. So that's the second technique for structuring according to character. The third technique is to think about your interaction of your character with other significant characters. Because usually your character doesn't change because of plot. They usually change because of conflict interactions with other characters. Sometimes that's support, sometimes it's tough love, sometimes it is an adversary, but they usually change because of their relationships with other people. This book can help you as well because this has all the different archetypes and then in the back of the book, it tells you how your archetypes kind of mesh and change each other. So there was interaction in Legally Blonde between Emmett and Elle. In the very beginning, when she had her first setback at college, he was there to kind of give her a little leg up. And uh, for Leventhal, you know, make sure you read the footnotes because that's where he gets a lot of his exam questions from. Right. Wow. I'm really glad I met you. <laughs> hey. When she was doing something ridiculous like wearing a bunny costume in the bookstore, he did not judge her, didn't say anything about it. He encouraged her to embrace her blondness. You know, being a blonde is actually a pretty powerful thing. You hold more cards than you think you do. And I personally would like to see you take that power and channel it towards the greater good, you know? When she wanted to give up, he told her not to give up. Forget about it. I'm going back to LA. We're wearing suits and we're pantyhose and we're trying to be something that I'm just, I'm just not. What if you're trying to be somebody you are? I'm in the hell with Callahan. S stay. And then even during the case, when things weren't working out, she wasn't having success again, he encouraged her. Well, in this book, as far as I can tell, I think his archetype is the archetype of the best friend. So this book in the back tells you when you have two different characters, how do those two characters change each other? So the waif and the best friend, it says the best friend sees the best in others if there is anything good to see, but he's not interested in wasting his time with folks who are bad news and cannot understand the waif's continual involvement with these types. Why can't she see people for what they are? And then it says they mesh, the best friend does not put up with the truly wicked, but neither does he demand perfection. He happily accepts foibles and flaws in his friends. The waif would never think of trying to change someone. She likes everyone the way they are. The acceptance these two offer each other is a pleasant change from the criticism offered by the rest of the world. So they both easily accept each other. It says how they change. The best friend is usually not the one to play the superhero, but she brings out all of his protective instincts. In the story, he is the right-hand man of the professor who she at first respects and admires and then finds out is kind of a D-bag. So then Emmett, who works for the professor, he stands up against the professor in the very end, which is something new we didn't see throughout the story. That I won't agree to. Uh, I'll supervise, Your Honor. So it says that he learns aggression is sometimes necessary. He learned to stand up. What did she learn from him? The waif has never known someone who is so accepting of her. He's not interested in changing her or making her into something she's not. Basking in the glow of his unconditional love, she gains the confidence to stand up for herself. So you can start plotting your story according to interactions with other major and sometimes minor characters and work out how they change your lead character. And now the final technique for plotting your script according to character is to not think so much about the plot, the plot, what happens in the plot, what's the plot. More think about the people in the story and how they affect your lead character. And there's two little sub techniques for that. The first one is to look at your theme. So in the book story by Robert McKee, an excellent book, I'll put a link for it down below. He talks about in the theme, 
to ex when you explore your theme, you have your theme, what the story is about, then you have something that is contrary to this theme because you're going to explore different facets of your theme. Then you have the contradictory to what your theme is, and then you have a negation of the negation. So his example is if you have love, that's what your theme is about. That's what you're investigating in your story. The contrary would just be indifference. The contradictory would be hate. And the negation of the negation would be hate masquerading as love. So in the story Legally Blonde, she's dealing with acceptance. She wants acceptance. So the contrary could be indifference. And there were a lot of people who at Harvard, they didn't necessarily dislike her. They didn't reject her, but they just didn't know what to think of her. The contradictory could be prejudice, where people are just flat out rejecting her. And the negation of the negation could be acceptance masking prejudice. And that's what we had with the professor that turned out to just want to hit on her. So you can think of your theme and create different characters that reflect the theme and then figure out from there how they would fit into your story and have the characters help create the plot instead of you just shoving random characters into the plot. Another technique for figuring out how to populate your script with different characters that will challenge the lead is to make exaggerations or reflections of your lead character. So Elle was the sorority girl. She came from money. She was pretty. She was cute. She had the cute little dog. There was a subplot that had to do with a nail technician who was sort of an exaggeration exaggerated trailer park kind of train wreck version of Elle. She also had a dog where her dog was the big mutt slobbery dog, not the cute little dog. Her fashion sense was kind of kooky and crazy, but in a way that didn't quite work and wasn't really cute. She comes from trailer parks. And then she also did not have self-confidence and acceptance. And when Elle would help her with her self-confidence, she was in a way helping herself because the other girl, Paulette, was a reflection of her. Then you also had an exaggeration of of Elle in The Woman Who Was Accused of Murder, Brooke. She's someone like Elle, but she is facing even worse prejudice and higher stakes. She could actually go to prison for the rest of her life or be facing the death penalty because she's being judged for being blonde. So she's in a similar situation as Elle, only worse. Then we have Vivian Warner's fiance, who is the vision of what Elle thinks she should be. And we also have the other professor who encouraged her to keep going in the end. She might not have been discriminated against because she was blonde, but we can pretty much guess she was discriminated against because she was a woman. And so she has been through what Elle's going through and come out the other end and is more what Elle is going to become, more the energy of what L needs. So you can play with your lead character and create maybe characters that are exactly the opposite of your character, characters that are an exaggeration, that are bigger than your character, that are kind of worse than your character, and have it be reflections, and then figure out how those characters would fit in the story, and that can help you come up with plot and figure out more your plot instead of, what I see too often is, you can tell someone just came up with a plot, and then they just pepper it with colorful characters that kind of really have nothing to do with the theme, have nothing to do with facets of the character. They're just like random people kind of shoved in there and it doesn't feel organic. And coming up with the characters first can help you brainstorm plot when you're trying to figure out how those characters fit in the story. It can help you come up with subplots or let's say you were writing Legally Blonde and you didn't have your second good idea yet. Remember I talked about how the warrior beat, usually the game changes. There's new information. So let's say you're writing Legally Blonde and you have your first good idea. Wouldn't it be funny if there's a pink blonde sorority girl in Harvard, but you hadn't yet come up with that second good idea that happens at that warrior beat where she actually starts to take on a real case and is acting as an attorney. Well, when you come up with all these facets of different characters, that could help you come up with that case. Because if you're trying to think of a situation where there could be someone like Elle who's facing an even worse prejudice because they're blonde, Brooke, the girl who was on trial, 
she was facing the death penalty because she's blonde, because people judged her harshly. So that could make you think, mm, how can I put that character in there? Oh, there could be this court case, and then boom, you could think of your second good idea to go in your story. So those are all techniques that you can use to more think about your character and then flesh it out from more the inside out instead of a left-brained, linear, external approach. But you can also go back and forth. You can kind of flesh it out a little bit with these character ideas then kind of put your left brain hat on, pull out whatever kind of a template you want to use for plotting, figure that out, then put your other character hat back on, flesh it out a little bit more, you can go back and forth. So there you go. I hope this helped you. If it did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up because that helps my wee little channel. And don't forget to subscribe because more videos are coming and I will talk to you later. Bye!